Hello guys and welcome back to the 25th part of the Kotlin UV2 Pro series. In the last part you learned about overloading functions and constructors. So we created a function max area here and one version of that function takes two shapes and one version of that function takes three shapes here. And we can um, name the function the same way and when we call it we can choose by our own if we pass two shapes here or if we pass three shapes. And we can do the same with constructors and classes. So instead of our rectangle class, we created two um, other ways to create a rectangle here. One way is to provide a single double value to create a square. And one way is to provide two integer values to create a rectangle with two integer values instead of two double values like we have it in the primary constructor. This tutorial will be about objects and companion objects. Sometimes we have properties of functions that don't rely on instances of an object and for that we can create what is called a singleton. So if we take a look in our circle class for example, we have the value pi here. And currently we made that variable uh, that ver pi private, so it is only visible within our circle class. But every time we create an instance of our circle class, we have another value pi. So each circle has its own value pi. But because pi is always the same, we can actually create a singleton object and save pi inside of that singleton object. And a singleton object is basically an object where only one single instance of exists. So to prevent that we save the variable pi for each single circle we create, we can go to our src folder, right click new, Kotlin file or class and make sure you select object now and I'll call it important numbers. And as you can see Kotlin created a new file for us and this time this is not a class anymore, instead it's an object. And every time we create an object like that, that means that this is a singleton. So that is just like a class, but there's only one single instance of that. So we cannot create additional instances like we um, could do it with classes. And inside of that object, we can now create the variable pi. So instead of that object, I generally want to um, put all the important numbers we have, but currently we only have the value pi. So important constants. Um, could that also be called? So I'll write val pi. You usually write them in capital letters and set that to the value of pi. And now we can go back to our circle.kt and delete that variable pi that we have here because we don't need it anymore. We declared it in the object important numbers. And as you can see, now our pi variable here is red because it doesn't know it. And to tell it that we want to have, we want to access the pi variable from our important numbers here, we just have to write important numbers dot pi. Oops. And the same below here, important numbers dot pi. So as you can see, we don't have to create an instance of important numbers. So we don't have to write something like, well, important numbers is equal to important numbers. As you can see, it underlines it in red because that's an object and we cannot create instances of that object because there is only one single instance of that object. And because of that, we can just write the object name followed by a dot and then the property we want to access from that object. And actually you can also put functions in here. So for example a function, um, I don't know, function. I, um, I cannot think of a particular function that makes sense for that important numbers object here. But I just want to show you that it works to create functions inside of that too. So inside of our circle for example we can just call important numbers dot function but I'll remove that because it doesn't make any sense here. But what if we want to have a class that has 
some properties or functions with that singleton behavior and which of which we can still create instances. So let's say we want to um, make that class have that behavior of that singleton, but only for specific functions or variables. In that case, we can create what is called a companion object. So inside of that class, we write companion object followed by two curly brackets. And that is very similar to what we did here. But here we only created a, an object here, not a companion object. So if we go back to our circle.kt file, let's say we want to create a function here that generates a random circle for us. That is a function that fits to the circle class, of course, because it generates a circle for us. But that is not a function that needs um, a specific instance of the circle class. So for that, we created that companion object. And inside of that object, we can create the function fun um, random circle. And that returns a circle, of course. And inside of that function body, we want to generate a random radius. So we had val radius is equal to random and make sure you select kotlin.random here, then it will automatically import what we need for that, import kotlin.random.random. If it does not import that automatically for you, then you have to type that line. That just means that we can access random functionality from now on. And after that random, we write a dot here. And as you can see, that is actually also um, an object class like we did before here because we don't need to create an instance of random like like this. Instead, we can just write a dot after that and write next um, double. And that double has three overload functions. And if we take the third one, you can see that we can enter a range. So a range from the first number to the second number will be the range our random number will be generated. So let's select that and enter, for example, 1 and 10. So our random number will be between 1 and 10. And after that, we can return an instance of our circle class with that radius that we just generated. So if we now go into our tutorials.kt file and want to create a random circle, then we create a val circle and set that to circle. And now make sure that you don't make parentheses here. In that case, we would create a circle with a specific radius that we enter here. So we create an object of that circle. But we want to create a random circle. And we want to access that companion object, that function inside of that companion object. And in that case, we just write a dot after that circle. And as you can see, we have that function random circle. Just press enter here. And if we run that program, you can see it still creates a circle, of course, because inside of our companion object, we create an instance here of circle. But the radius of that circle is chosen randomly between 1 and 10. And that is now a really cool function because we don't need to provide a radius because we generate it randomly. Um, and we don't even need an instance of that circle object to generate one randomly. So don't get me wrong here. We created an instance here of our circle class, but we didn't need an instance to create that instance. So we didn't need to write, well, my circle is equal to circle with radius five, for example, and then write my circle dot random circle that doesn't work because we put the random circle function inside of a companion object. But if we take a look at our circle class and cut that function from the companion object and paste it into our circle class, then that would work. So that is basically the difference between functions inside of a companion object and functions inside of a general class here. So if you put it in into the, the class just like that, then we need an instance of that class to call that function. 
if we put it back into the companion object, then we don't need an instance to call that function. So in that case, we just write circle.randomCircle and we can delete that instance above here. Your homework for this video is to create that same functionality for your rectangle class. So you should create a companion object for that rectangle class and inside of that companion object, you create a function that generates a random rectangle. Finally, I want to go through the solution of the homework of the last video, where you should create two functions. So one, actually one function and you should overload that function. One function should take a list as an argument and one function should take an array. And that function should print that list. For example, first the first element, then the last one, then the two, the four and the three. So in alternating order. And to actually accomplish that behavior, I created two variables, i and j. i starts from the left at the one, so at actually at the index zero. And j starts at the right, at the index of list.size minus one. And I created a variable toggle, a boolean, set that to true initially, that determines whether I increase i by one or decrease j by one. And in the first iteration, we want to increase i by one because we want to print the number one here first. And if toggle is false, then we want to print the item at index j and decrease j by one. And at the end of each iteration, we toggle that Boolean. So if it is true, then we want to have it as false. And if it was false, then it is true from now. And then you can just copy that function and paste it below with the same functionality and just pass in an array as a parameter and make sure it is an array of integers. And then you have successfully overloaded that function and you can call it with an array here. So I created an array of that, um, of those values and I can call that function with that array and with that list. So yeah, that's it for this video. I hope you like it. If so, please leave a like and comment below. Also, if you have any questions, then don't mind asking them in the comments so I can answer them. And yeah, have a good day. See you in the next video. Bye bye.